Hello, everyone, and welcome to the day two of our 23rd annual meeting. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yesterday's presentations, and I'm sure that today we have even more fascinating presentations with lively discussion and entertaining debate. Now, my fellow chairs and I will host the meeting and pose your questions and the remarks to the speakers, so we urge you to take part by using the chat box uh, on the right of your screen where you can send in your comments. Please, it would also be very helpful to us if you added your name and country uh, at the end of your comments. So now, some of you will be aware that every year we hold a special Hatter Award Lecture, named after the patron of the Hatter Cardiovascular Institute, Sir Maurice Hatter. This award goes to eminent individuals who have made huge impact in their respective fields, be it cardiology, diabetes, or nephrology. And this year, we are proud to give this award to an individual who really more than fulfills all the values of the award, and that is Professor Mark Pfeffer from the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. I believe that the best way to describe Mark's achievements are to read from this plaque that I hold here which we are about to give to him after his presentation. And the plaque says that the Hatter Award for 2021 is given to Dr. Mark Pfeffer, MD, whose pioneering research led to the concept that angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors could mitigate adverse ventricular remodeling, fodling myocardial infarction, and that ACE inhibition use would result in increased survival and therefore have direct clinical benefits. Dr. Pfeffer is an internationally recognized clinical investigator and authority in the field of cardiovascular medicine. He has made numerous seminal contributions in the area of basic and clinical research, and his globally acclaimed research work is widely published and attests to the impact that he has made on the lives of those at risk from heart disease. So, Mark, it's a pleasure to welcome you, and we look forward to your Hatter Award Lecture. Well, what a delight for me to be your Hatter Lecturer. I've heard several. Uh, puts me in a distinguished group who uh, go out of their way to give an excellent lecture on the topic chosen. Uh, I have my hands tied because I'm the first had a lecturer to do it in 10 minutes. So let's get to work. Uh, what about heart failure with preserved? Well, uh, actually, uh, it's a new entity. Uh, so it's a new entity. If you look at all the definitions of heart failure, the word ejection fraction doesn't come in. And I'm not gonna go through these. I'm going to take you through the epi, whether it's Framingham or the European or Gothenburg. Here's how we define heart failure. The word ejection fraction does not appear. So heart failure, we used to call it congestive heart failure, uh, is an entity. And we have arbitrarily made a subgroup with ejection fraction. So let's go through that a second. In the history of uh, clinical trials of heart failure, the word congestive heart failure, uh, again, even in the early trials, here's consensus. I could have gone to VHEF. Neither used the word ejection fraction. And importantly, they were all about all-cause mortality. The, the question in the early days is, can you make someone with congestive heart failure live longer? Ejection fraction didn't appear. And the answer was yes. But who are these people? Well, uh, the word about this diastolic heart failure uh, preserved didn't even enter our lexicon until the mid 60s when uh, actually it came about from nuclear medicine labs what were basically saying, who are these people? They're sending me people with heart failure I measured their nuclear ejection fraction because in those days, that's how you measured it. And it's quite normal. 
and two publications came out around the same time in the mid 80s. And it became more uh, something on the tip of our tongues. Yes, we know there are these people, but what about them? Well, we knew very little about them. And then we knew even less because Jay Cohn, uh, one of the pioneers in his very first VHEF trial analyzed the few people who snuck in or came in uh, who had a more preserved ejection fraction, not quite reduced. And he did a mortality analysis and found that they don't die at the same rate. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a problem, but it was a problem for the clinical trialist. Then it became our problem because clinical trialists would say, if I'm going to do a trial about congestive heart failure and my endpoint is mortality, I'm going to exclude those patients. So here in the 1990s, let's exclude those patients. It doesn't mean they didn't exist, but they didn't exist in the clinical trials. Now, let me show you something. Here's the best uh, series. We have three very important beta blocker studies on top of an ACE inhibitor. So here we're in the, we're in the, the uh, end of the 1990s. Beta block is good, beta block is good, but the end point is all cause mortality, all cause mortality. And now excluding people with uh, a more preserved ejection fraction. So we just don't have the information. Enter charm. Now I'm not doing this as though we invented heart failure, but we did put the word preserved on. We had the ability to study the whole spectrum. Now, we still were using all-cause mortality for the primary of the overall study, but we developed the composite saying that for the populations, the smaller populations, not the 7,000, the endpoint is going to be CV death or heart failure hospitalization. That's the beginning of the composite. And here's what we found. Those with more preserved EF over 40, uh, they had the same reduction in quality of life, but just like Dr. Cohn said, they didn't die at the same rate. Well, they did have a lot of hospitalizations, but mortality. So if you wanna study this group, you can't do just a mortality trial unless it's a very, uh, very large trial that uh, uh, resources are generally not available for. So event rates are lower due to uh, less death. Now, but let's study these people. So if you're gonna study them, it really starts with charm preserved. And it was not that it was magical. It was the beginning of let's look for these people Let's bring them into the study, but we need to use a composite endpoint. And so the history doesn't go back very far. So we lag by about two to three decades of the reduced ejection fraction. And let me bring you right up to date. Let's go right to TopCat. Okay, you've seen this. Uh, there was something wrong about those enrolled in Russia and Georgia, the country Georgia. They didn't have the syndrome of heart failure. And now we know they didn't even get the drug. So let's concentrate on these. And it is, they do have a lot of hospitalizations. They do uh, have the composite CV death. And spironolactone in a post hoc analysis was helpful, 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 helpful. And then it depends on you. Uh, are you going to wait for uh, a more pre-specified one, or is this good enough for you? It's up to you. You're seeing patients. We give you the safety. We give you the efficacy. And for, for, as far as I'm concerned, spironolactone to be used judiciously with safety measures is a good therapy for these people. But I'm not the regulatory agencies. I'm not the guideline writers. That's my opinion. Now, uh, the field is moving on. So, uh, Sucubitol valsartan, very effective in those who reduced, a very proper trial with uh, 5,000 people, 
and the endpoint now is the uh, multiple heart failure hospitalizations and CV death, uh, and shows a very, uh, you know, uh, almost, but to me, this is when you have to treat people, uh, this side of the line or that side of the O5 line is less important than there was a difference. Now, this has just been to the FDA and they're going to be approving it. Uh, I'll show you why in a second, because it does, uh, it does reflect the field today. What they did was they said, there's something about the people with ejection fraction over 60 where we don't see a therapeutic effect, but in those below 60, we do. And obviously they have a whole spectrum of those below 60 because they had a reduced ejection fraction trial also. But it's not unique to Secubitril Valsartan. We see the same thing in TopCat. Something about those over 60 that they don't show the same benefit of the same exact therapy. Well, let's go back to CHARM. Same story. Benefit, benefit, benefit. Over 60, we're not seeing the benefit. So let's put them all together. Candace Artin tested the whole range, uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, the whole range, Secubitril so Valsartan, the whole range. There's something about hitting that 60 line where we start losing efficacy, but let's look at the broad population under there. Benefit, benefit, benefit. So what are we learning? You, today, you have to use your judgment and your judgment, that patient in front of you. But I'm asked to discuss the future too, and I'm pretty bullish on it. We went from having no trials to now there are uh, here trials over a thousand patients. Uh, so with really clinical endpoints, we're gonna have a DAPA, we're gonna have another spironolactone, we're gonna have an EMPA, we're gonna have another spironolactone, and we're gonna have a phenarinone. Phenar 2021, 2021, 2021, 2024. So from not having trials, we're getting trials. So that's a short-term future, the next three to four years. How about the long-term future? I'm very bullish. We're gonna be redefining the population. We're gonna be using genotype, phenotype, omics. We're gonna be picking out people with amyloid. We're gonna be picking out people with different phenotypic characteristics. Once we show a therapy works in this group, what's gonna happen is the splitters will come in, we'll find the group that needs the therapy, and we're gonna be investigating people with this syndrome, finding what the appropriate bin is, and finding their therapies. Now, this is artificial intelligence, uh, uh, machine learning, I don't think computers are gonna replace us and take care of these patients, but I do think it's gonna help us identify people better match for different therapies. So that's future, future. But today you've got to use the data in front of you. You have to be uh, uh, vigilant. You have to understand this is real. Half of the people with heart failure have this. They can be made better. Uh, the main trick is prevent in the first place treat hypertension and treat uh, risk factors so that fewer people develop this syndrome. But once they do, don't throw your hands up and don't say, oh, guidelines say there's nothing. That's not true. There are things today and there'll be more things in the future. And I'm delighted to be your 10 minute Hatter lecturer. Thank you for your 10 minute attention. Thank you so much for a truly fantastic uh, Hatter Award lecture. Uh, really, really wonderful. And I'm going to stretch, uh, hand by this clock to you by stretching out all the way to Boston to see if you can take it and keep that for yourself. Oh, wait, Derek, could you keep it out there a little longer? I, 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 I can just start seeing it. Hold on, Derek. Reach out further, Derek. Thank you, Derek. I got it. You know, Mark, you and I will never, will, will, will never make an actors, uh, uh, good actors, but thank you so much again for that wonderful presentation. Now, there's going to be questions coming in, and there's none yet, because I've got a couple, but there is one uh, remark that's coming from a very dear friend and colleague of yours, 
that just says, congratulations to Mark from Peter Libby. Now, well, Mark, uh, several of the prior Hatter lecturers have uh, reminded me that uh, I carried their bag for their Hatter lecture. But I walked here myself, Derek. No one carried my bag. Mark, just while the questions are slowly coming in now, let me just ask you a couple of things. Now, age, you made it clear, age is a major comorbidity. Uh, what is it about age? What is it that we need to find out that you know, this, you could argue this with COVID, with many things, with diabetes, with whatever. What is it about age here that you think is uh, causing the problem? Well, uh, age is a comorbidity for everything. As a matter of fact, if I see a data set and age doesn't come out as a predictor, I think there's something wrong with the data. Okay, so it's as so, simple but, as that. Uh, you lose reserve capacity. You lose reserve capacity as you age. I think it's for every disease. Can I, talking about preserved ejection fraction, there's a question come in here, and I'm not sure who it's from, but it says, uh, if it is not the time that we all standardize and agree on a proper definition of preserved ejection fraction, is 40% or is it 60%, 55 etc., cetera, or at least agree on an acceptable range of values? Would you accept that? Well, that's the whole story of uh, how did we get here in the first place. It was called congestive heart failure. We didn't have the ejection fraction. And then when we started to put people in bins, uh, the mortality differences, and that was what I was talking about, made it clear that some people can't be in a mortality trial if you want to have an answer in the next few years. But that doesn't mean they don't have a lot of morbidity. So. I don't have an answer, Derek, but I think what's clear is what the future is going to be is match the therapy for the disease. Right now, we just throw everybody in the same basket and throw pills at them. I am very bullish. We're going to be saying, who are the people with amyloid? They should have a different therapy. Yeah. And we're going to, that's where we're going. Okay. Another question has come in on, on uh, the preliminary data with respect to sotocaflozin. Um, what is your opinion? I mean, bearing in mind, sodicoflozin, if I'm not mistaken, is slightly more SD1 versus SD2. Is that correct? Yes. Well, not slightly more. It's the only one that we've, that's been studied that has some SD2 in it. Okay. SD, but, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, very impressive as all, the, all, all of the SD, uh, LT2 and 1 studies have been. Extremely impressive. You know, this day and age, if you're looking for a 10, 12% improvement, that's great. We're seeing 25 consistently with these drugs. So uh, they're about to be unveiled in heart failure with preserve. We're about to get two of them just this year. There's a question from Charlie Thompson of Morpeth in the United Kingdom, and he says, is heart failure with ejection fraction uh, greater than 60, a heart disease or a kidney disease? Yeah, so, uh, Charlie, I, since they're not responding to any of the medic, this, uh, now I'm just talking about those with an EF over 60. So, Charlie is now further defining preserved, as am I, because it seems strange to me that candesartan didn't work over 60, uh, uh, spironolactone didn't, nor did secubitril valsartan, all affected below 60. So, Charlie, I think that the n new frontier is who are these people with EFs over 60 with signs and symptoms, impaired quality of life, and then maybe we'll have better therapies later. But right now, they're not responding to therapies that, re that lower EFs do respond to. Thanks, Mark. And another question has come through. Again, I'm not sure where this is from, but it says, <clears throat> excuse me, are there ways of predicting those patients with hypertension who will go on to develop uh, HEFPEF? Yes, yes. So everyone with hypertension should be treated. Uh, when you treat hypertension, you're reducing risk of stroke, you're reducing a risk of AF. The most, uh, the highest risk reduction is for heart failure. Anyone who has structural heart disease already has left atrial enlargement, has some signs of hypertrophy. These are people that will benefit even more because their absolute risk is even greater. 
We've, we've still got time for questions. John, do you want to come in with anything specific? There's some more coming through. But well, then let me add I'm to just, that. Um, uh, I'm just sorry, intrigued, you, intrigued, Mark, to know. May I add? Um, add Natriuretic that... peptide is another measurement that helps discriminate those at even greater risk. This bread and butter hypertension. Insurance companies use it if you're going to buy life insurance. They want to know your blood pressure. They also want to know your natriuretic peptide. John? Mark, amongst the, um, those with the ejection fraction greater than 60, um, who are the, essentially the non-responders, do you think there's a significant risk that we're missing some important subsets within that group who indeed do respond? Uh, yes, John, and that is where I see the future, is that we're going to be splitting based on data. Right now, uh, uh, we don't have it, but we're going to... People are going to be doing omics. You heard about the artificial intelligence. Uh, this whole field is, is about to explode. What are the phenotypes of the people who will benefit and from what therapies will they benefit? Stay tuned. Uh, Mark, um, throughout my career, heart failure has always been the holy grail as far as I'm concerned. And um, do you think we are really now approaching that in terms of understanding, in terms of benefit for once. I know there's been pharmacology available, but with the new pharmacology available, do you think we've reached the limits? No, Derek. I think the one thing about heart failure is the whole humility. I mean, the SGLT2 inhibitors, that was just found by, uh, by accident almost. Yeah, we wouldn't yeah. have known that. So. I want some more accidents. Uh, the positive inotropes, I would have guessed everything on that, but no, they didn't work. And the opposite, beta blockers. So I think we just need to be humble. Uh, there's still a long way to go and uh, keep our eyes open and look for those little clues and then pursue them with vigorous trials. Um, we've still got a few more minutes left for a couple of questions and here's another one for you, uh, Mark. Can you comment on the relationship between obesity and uh, HEFPEF, and should we target obesity? Yes, it, it, is, it even goes back to the earlier question about who with hypertension. So I could have thanked the uh, questioner because they're reminding me, yes. So what is it about obesity? Well, there's, there's some changes in heart structure. If you just look at the uh, populations, those with more obesity have a little more uh, mass. Others are saying that there's something about the epicardial fat. I've not bought into that, but as I said, with humility, I'm open. It, it, what is going on there? So, uh, yes, obesity is a factor. How? I can't quite tell you, but uh, it does change your natriuretic peptide level. Yeah. So there's a lot going on, and, you know, this thing about learning, that's the beauty of... So this Hatter Award, we're, we're lucky. We're in a field where we continue to learn. So I'm going to keep my eyes open and listen to more of the basics presentation and be ready. Well, it's just before you go, Mark, we've got about 40 seconds left. One more question from Simon Waldman in London, and that is, why do patients with HEFPEF not excite the REF system in the same way as HEFREF? Well, they will when you give them the diuretic. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, maybe that's why subtubitol valsartan is working so well. Uh, I also don't know the answer to that question. And uh, a well, former... I'm glad to, there are some questions you don't know the answer to. That will keep Both. us all going. Thank you very much, Mark. There's loads more questions coming through. I wish we could spend another 20 minutes, but unfortunately Thank you for not. The honor. Thank you so much for a brilliant talk, Mark, and uh, look forward to seeing you in person very soon. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Cunningham, co-chairing this session. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Professor Ben Humphreys. Uh, ben is uh, Chief of the Division of Nephrology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, which incidentally is when I did my fellowship in nephrology some years ago more years than I care to admit. Uh, ben wasn't there then. He was probably at medical school, um, I suspect, when I was doing my fellowship. Um, but he now uh, heads a distinguished faculty at that institution. 
Uh, his uh, uh, academic uh, reputation is built around uh, kidney fibrosis, stem cell research, and regenerative medicine. Um, and um, I'm looking forward very much to hearing what he has to say, uh, addressing the title of How Can We Help the Damaged Kidney to Regenerate? Ben. Hello, it's a pleasure to be with you virtually. The title of my talk is How Can We Help the Damaged Kidney to Regenerate? These are my disclosures. They are not relevant to the presentation today. I'll be touching on three areas related to AKI. Kidney organoids and how they can be used to model and ultimately treat AKI. Metabolic stress resistance as a therapeutic target. And the, the Kidney Precision Medicine Project. When a healthy kidney is injured acutely, there is tubular damage, inflammation, vascular injury, and tubular obstruction. In many cases, tubular repair occurs successfully, and that's shown on the upper right. This involves epithelial proliferation, resolution of inflammation, endothelial repair, and regeneration. But in some cases, a maladaptive repair process occurs in which inflammation persists and tubular repair does not occur normally, leading to scar formation, and ultimately chronic kidney disease, and in some cases, end-stage renal failure. Therapeutic strategies in improving outcomes in AKI, therefore, are focused on improving productive, successful repair on the top, and minimizing maladaptive or failed repair on the bottom. When discussing therapeutic approaches to AKI in humans, it's important to bring a healthy dose of humility given the poor track record in translating findings from the lab to the clinic. This is just one example, the PRESERVE trial, which compared bicarbonate to saline or N-acetylcysteine to placebo in contrast-induced AKI. This was a well-powered, well-designed trial, and as you can see on the right, it was completely negative. But we are all aware of the recent impressive results of SGLT2 inhibitors in the treatment of diabetic nephropathy and other non-diabetic chronic kidney diseases. Here, the CREDENCE trial with very impressive results uh, studying canagliflozin, suggesting that we might be at the dawn of a new era for therapies in kidney diseases. I'll turn now to organoids, and this is a young field. The first papers published only seven years ago. The concept, though, is relatively straightforward and is shown in the cartoon on the right. We now have the capability to take human somatic cells, reprogram them into pluripotent stem cells, and then through stepwise differentiation generate either pure populations of kidney cells or kidney organoids that can be used to model a kidney on a chip for transplantation into mice or ultimately as a source of replacement tissue. Despite being a young field, the results to date have been relatively impressive. Here I compare a healthy human kidney section on the left to a kidney organoid section on the right. If you focus on the bottom, you can clearly see on the right-hand side glomeruli surrounded by tubules and an interstitium and an overall pattern that's quite reminiscent of a real kidney. The main difference being enhanced nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio reflecting the immaturity of an organoid. One can use these uh, kidney organoids to model acute kidney injury. Here, the tubular toxicant cisplatin has been uh, exposed to organoids, resulting in upregulation of tubular damage markers NGAL and HAVCRA1, also known as kidney injury molecule 1, both by mRNA on the left and on the right by immunofluorescence, where you can see the red staining of uh, KIM1 on the left and NGAL on the right. But organoids are not ready for clinical translation. There are a number of reasons why. For one, up to 20% of cells in kidney organoids are non-renal. For example, in green and yellow on the bottom, we can see neurons that are present within these organoids. Muscle cells also uh, uh, appear frequently. There's a lack of vascu vasculature. Here in green, you can see endothelial cells, but they do not form lumens that are disconnected with each other, and they're certainly not perfused. Kidney parenchymal cells are immature as well, uh, resembling second trimester kidney rather than adult. And finally, there's a lack of a collecting system. This is a cross-section of a collecting duct. It ends in a blind pouch, so it, even if we were able to form a filtrate, there's nowhere for that filtrate to go. There's no ureter or bladder. For these reasons, uh, organoids are best suited 
currently and for the foreseeable future for preclinical study. But targeting proximal tubule metabolism is an area that has already transitioned to clinical study. And uh, by way of introduction, this is the predominant ways that cells uh, generate energy. On the left, glycolysis, uh, which is anaerobic, and on the right, fatty acid oxidation. Proximal tubule uses fatty acid oxidation uh, as it is uh, very efficient at generating ATP given the large en energy demands of the tubule. NAD is required for both fatty acid oxidation on the right and glycolysis on the left. It's a universal electron acceptor and it's rate limiting in fatty acid oxidation. The important concept that has emerged over the last years is that in AKI, damage to mitochondria results in a metabolic shift to glycolysis, which is dependent on NAD levels. These, uh, it, through work by Samir Parikh in Boston and others, it has become apparent that there is not only a metabolic shift, but also a defect in NAD biosynthesis. On the left, the de novo pathway for generation of NAD, wherein quinolinate is the most proximate precursor. Quinolinate levels in ischemia reperfusion injury go up in the upper right hand in red, suggesting a block in metabolism or generation to NAD. And this is indeed true when NAD levels are measured in kidneys on the bottom right. This block in NAD levels impairs proximal tubule energetics and exacerbates AKI. That can be seen here where the enzyme that converts quinolinate to NAD, QPRT, has been knocked out. This leads to enhanced injury in a mouse model of AKI shown in the red bar on the left. That can be rescued, however, by administration of exogenous NAM or nicotinamide, which can be converted to NAD through a salvage pathway that does not rely on the QPRT enzyme. Indeed, on the right-hand side, you can see that nicotinamide administration given after injury in a mouse model of AKI can prevent serum creatinine rise in red. These preclinical results have now been extended into some, several small proof of principle trials. Here, three groups were tested in the ICU, placebo, a low and a high dose of NAM, given to patients undergoing on-pump cardiac bypass grafting, which is characterized by high rates of AKI. You can see in the upper left that the low and the high doses of nicotinamide resulted in high circulating levels of NAM, and that the proportion of patients who underwent AKI in red on the bottom right was much lower at about 15 or 20 percent in the NAM groups compared to roughly 50 percent AKI in the uh, placebo. These studies have now been translated to randomized control trials which are ongoing. Three of them are shown here. Results are expected in the next few years and there is optimism amongst the community for a positive result given the biologically plausible mechanism. Finally, I want to touch on the future of therapeutics and study in AKI, which is exemplified by the kidney medicine, uh, kidney precision medicine project, which uses um, human tissues in AKI. We don't typically biopsy, but this is a study that is collecting human AKI biopsies, sending them to a central repository, and then applying a very cutting edge uh, techniques um, to interrogate these tissue tissues, and then use computational approaches, including um, AI to um, uh, assess at a much finer level of detail that we've been, than we've been able to do in the past to ultimately generate a kidney tissue atlas of AKI. In conclusion, kidney organoids have great promise predominantly for modeling AKI in the lab, but not as an organ replacement for several decades at least. Targeting the metabolic switch, on the other hand, is quite encouraging given its uh, biologic mechanism and encouraging results from observation trials that are now being transitioned to randomized trials. And advances in massively high throughput methods combined with computation offer great promise for future efforts around therapeutic discovery ex as exemplified by the KPMP. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, great talk um, and uh, really beautifully straddling the uh, the bench to the bedside, uh, I thought, um, and tackling an area of huge clinical importance. I mean, the increase in mortality and morbidity with AKI complicating almost any illness is well known and is still huge, of course. 
I just wanted to ask you uh, a question myself, first of all, and that's about the repurposing of nicotinamide, um, which um, uh, many will have heard of, but many won't, I suspect, in the audience. Um, that's moved quite a long way down the line, hasn't it? Um, uh, just uh, what, what do you, how, how optimistic are you about that? Well, nicotinamide has indeed moved from the bench uh, to the bedside, as it were, uh, quite rapidly in the kinds of drug development timelines that we're normally used to. And I think what's uh, particularly inspiring about the potential use of nicotinamide as a therapeutic is that it really has been driven by advances in our understanding of the basic biology of how proximal tubule uh, um, energetics change during during acute injury. In other words, it's been driven by fundamental biologic insight that we've gained through uh, research at the bench. And uh, as, as you allude, it has gone from a very sort of uh, phase one safety kinds of trials, uh, which as I showed, ne nevertheless provided some, some fairly um, optimistic observational data into a much larger phase two, phase two B trials uh, with thousands of patients. So, uh, you know, I, <laughs> fingers crossed, I, I think, you know, as I mentioned in the talk, it's important to be humble when you're talking about clinical trials in AKI, given our, you know, very poor track record over the past three decades. Nevertheless, this is a, 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 a very safe agent. Um, it's known, it, our body uses it, and, um, and I think it has a very plausible biologic uh, mechanism of action, which makes me quite optimistic that it, it might actually find a, a home therapeutically in the ICU. Yeah. Are the doses used similar to those in other indications with nicotinamide? The doses are um, relatively high, and, um, but one of the nice things about Samir Parikh's study um, is that he used a sort of a medium and a high dose, and um, both of them achieve, again, in a very small observational trial, so this all has to be um, uh, redone in, in much larger studies, but the medium dose uh, had uh, similar efficacy in terms of raising um, uh, uh, nicotinamide levels in the serum and in terms of you know, apparent protection from AKI. So I think that um, these are not going to be sort of super therapeutic dosing strategies uh, at, at the end of the day. Thank you. Now we've got some questions flooding in now. Um, got one here saying, um, are we at the point where SGLT2 inhibitors should routinely be given to patients post-AKI and with CKD? I suppose one could add to that and say, well, should they be given pre-anticipated AKI in patients with CKD? Well, I, you know, there is tremendous, you know, I have tremendous optimism about broader use of SGLT2 inhibitors. I mean, th this is the dawn of a new age in nephrology and for treatment of CKD, and the effects have been spectacular. Now, um, I don't think we're at the point where we should be giving them uh, routinely um, uh, post-AKI uh, I think we need to. We still need to do the trials and um, um, determine the evidence base for that. What I will say is that the evidence for use of SGLT2 inhibitors in non-diabetic CKD is very strong, and so the 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 basis for that question I think is quite sound. Uh, if 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 SGLT2 inhibitors um, strongly prevent non-diabetic CKD progression would they not also prevent the AKI to CKD transition? And um, uh, should we be get, doing that routinely clinically? I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm just one bridge too far, uh, but I think it's an absolutely a question that we should be studying and um, enrolling patients in trials. And, uh, and, and that's another area of great optimism. Another question here, which I think has probably come from a cardiologist, um, saying we often see episodes of transient fall in GFR uh, in patient charts over a period of time following recurrent episodes of hypotension with, with arrhythmias, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, are these markers of prognost prognostic renal risk? Well, they probably are. And I think 
we in nephrology are really grappling with how to best capture kidney function. How do we move beyond estimated glomerular filtration rate? And what are the um, drawbacks of relying so heavily on EGFR? And it, indeed, there has been a very robust discussion about the uh, use of the race modifier in, in EGFR and how that disadvantages um, a minority communities in terms of uh, getting access to kidney transplantation. And so that's sort of a long way of saying, absolutely, I do believe that these falls in, in GFR, these sort of what we would call, in the past we would call a bump in creatinine, uh, probably does reflect reduced renal reserve. And um, uh, there is, there are in, in fact ways of measuring this quantitatively. They're, they're not used clinically. But uh, one can uh, protein load a patient and measure their ability to increase their GFR. And a healthy kidney can, in response to a large protein load, can increase GFR by 30 to 40 percent. Uh, but kidneys that have subclinical damage that is not captured by uh, eGFR it can only increase their uh, G, their GFR to a protein load by five or ten percent, and that probably is clinically meaningful. Um, what we lack, though, is the ability to apply that knowledge uh, for prognostication, and we need better biomarkers to capture the full complement of kidney function. Another critically important practical question here, and that is the timing of nicotinamide in relation to the non-predictable nature of AKI. Yes, well, uh, this is uh, this is indeed uh, critically important. I, I, I mean, I think on the one hand, you, you could say uh, patients that are undergoing a uh, procedure such as uh, on-pump cardiac bypass uh, who are at high risk of developing AKI, maybe they should receive a prophylactic dose of nicotinamide given its safety. Uh, on the other hand, in the preclinical studies from uh, the Perique lab, they employed in a mouse model of AKI a therapeutic dosing strategy in which NAD was given uh, 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 12 hours after injury. And so this would be sort of similar to patients in the ICU who had developed AKI based on a rise in their creatinine um, early on in the course. And, and it still showed a similar efficacy to, to um, prophylactic dosing regimens. And, and that's actually a very, a very important point because there are many drugs in the lab that we can use to um, uh, prophylactically prevent uh, AKI, but when you give them after the injury, uh, they have no effect. It's too late. The horse is out of the barn. Uh, and, but, but that's not the case for nicotinamide. Yeah, well, that's potentially a huge uh, advantage, isn't it, over uh, other things we've had. Uh, comment on uh, contrast-induced nephropathy with nicotinamide. Well, contrast-induced nephropathy is the, t the topic that just won't won't go away, uh, r really. And um, and I think uh, the, the 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 trials that have been done um, in primarily cardiac procedures uh, are ones that involve typically the use of contrast, but also hypotension and blood loss and and so on. So. Um, on the one hand, uh, a, a proportion of the cases um, in humans uh, where nicotinamide appears to exert a, a, a benefit um, probably uh, have reflected some degree of contrast-induced uh, AKI. On the other hand, uh, th there remains a debate over the degree to which contrast um, really has the ability to um, induce severe AKI. Uh, and so I think that's, uh, uh, you know, a topic for, for which we could probably spend a, a whole uh, another seminar on. Well, we've got, I think, one minute, in fact, uh, rather than a whole seminar. And I'd just like to ask you one question. How is the nicotinamide given? IV, oral, either? Nick, it can be given either. In the trials, it was, it was given IV. These were, these were ICU patients and... Um, uh, the the, the, random is, the the plan was that they had a, a two different hospitals. In one hospital, 
altered their COVID AKI protocol such that all patients with AKI would receive uh, nicotinamide IV uh, as part of their normal care algorithm. Right. Well, I think that just about concludes it. Uh, we're stopping about 15 seconds early. Uh, nice timing, Ben. A great talk again. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. I'm now going to hand back to my co-chair, Derek Yellen. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce another polymath uh, to everyone today, a good friend of mine. Uh, he graduated the University of Cape Town. Uh, he got his DPhil from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and he received his PhD from the University of Coimbra in Portugal. And the only thing that I have in common with, with him is that we have the same accent. Um, otherwise, it is a true pleasure to introduce him to you. Bernard Gersh uh, from the Mayo Clinic uh, will now give a talk on the rise and fall and possible resurrection of renal artery denervation for hypertension. I'm going to talk about renal artery denervation for hypertension, and in particular, the rise, the fall, and the potential resurrection of this technique. Now, the history uh, and the physiology of the procedure is well established. In this study, uh, or this review by Dr. Murray Esler on the sympathetic nervous system, he uh, makes the statement that evidence has been assembled in the past three decades, which indicates that sympathetic nervous system activation is crucial in the development of cardiovascular disorders, most notably heart failure and essential hypertension. And uh, about starting about 10 to 15 years ago, where a number of uncontrolled or non-randomized studies of renal denervation, which really showed 25 to 30 millimeter reductions in blood pressure. One of the first at the top was the Simplicity One trial. And if you look at the x-axis on the bottom, you see that with denervation, there was about a 25 millimeter drop in blood pressure. This was followed by Simplicity Two, which was a randomized trial of denervation, uh, shown on the right, 30 millimeter drop in blood pressure with controls who, th that were unblinded, no sham procedure, unblinded. And you see that the change in blood pressure and controls was almost zero. The third trial, Simplicity Hypertension 3, compared denervation in orange with um, a sham control arm in blue. And what you see is a significant reduction in blood pressure in both arms, uh, including the sham control arm, and uh, which was not significant, statistically significantly different. And the difference between simplicity two and simplicity three was in the uh, controls in those with a sham arm, significant drop in blood pressure, and in unblinded controls, no change in blood pressure. You will also see that in the sham arm with the placebo effect, there was a reduction in the magnitude with denervation from 35 millimeters uncontrolled to about 12 millimeters or 11 millimeters. So simplicity hypertension three really shocked the hypertension world. We all felt that this technique would be successful. And uh, the late Sabu Ram Tula described the natural history of evolving therapies shown here. Progress followed by excitement, euphoria. Maybe that's where we were five, six years ago. Then a reality check depression, and then everything gets placed into perspective. And I think we could say that after Simplicity Hypertension 3, the initial enthusiasm had been tempered, and uh, the number of unanswered questions was increasing, but nonetheless, the concept remained of interest. Potential explanations for the lack of benefit in Simplicity Hypertension 3 included uh, the following, was the wrong catheter, operators were inexperienced, the power of the placebo, the Hawthorne effect, progression to the mean, drug adherence, uh, which was a confounder, the use of office BP versus ambulatory blood pressure. Suffice it to say, all of these explanations probably were operative and contributory to some extent. But I think there really was general acceptance that technical issues may be important 
and need to be addressed. But a realization, again, about the power of the placebo and the importance of sham controls. This led to three subsequent trials or four subsequent trials, which took into account many of the limitations technically of simplicity hypertension three. The spiral trial of which I chaired the data safety monitoring board. So I'm very familiar with this trial. Spiral off was uh, patients off medicines after a period of washout. Yellow uh, is renal denervation, orange is sham. And what you see is a statistically significant difference between the two arms of five millimeters of mercury in systolic um, uh, blood pressure, 24 hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure. In those on medicines, uh, 7.4 millimeter difference in 24 hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure. And in the uh, radiant solo trial using an ultrasound guided uh, procedure, daytime ambulatory blood pressure reduced by eight millimeters of mercury in all of these patients. So all of these trials, statistically significant. Now, this is a concern. This is the spiral hypertension off trial. And if you look at responders, 28% non-responders on the left with renal denervation, 52% non-responders with sham controls. But what is really quite striking is, as you'll see, some of the patients who responded had 25 millimeter drops in blood pressure and some of the sham control arm had 35 millimeter drops in blood pressure. So we need to understand more about the non-responders and more about what it is that causes the blood pressure to drop in those who are in the control arm. So pivotal keys to the clinical future, identify responders, the ability to assess procedural efficacy. Uh, we don't have any way of doing this at the time of the procedure. How do we assess the durability of efficacy? Uh, do we understand the phenotypes better? We need to understand the pathophysiology of hypertension is very variable and which phenotypes are likely to benefit as opposed to those who will not. Other questions, how much blood pressure reduction is enough? Is five millimeters or eight millimeters, 10 millimeters enough? And do we understand the real mechanisms of benefit? So to close, this is a, a cable sent by Mark Twain from London to the United States after he was uh, having his breakfast at a London hotel and he read his own obituary in the US press. And he sent the following telegram, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. I believe the reports of the demise of renal hypertension were greatly exaggerated, but there are still many unanswered questions um, that remain. I think that there has been some resurrection of this technique, but we still need more answers to many questions. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for another one of your superb talks. You never fail to, to let us down. You are fantastic. <laughs> Um, sorry, uh, Bernard, uh, let me be serious now for, for a minute. We're waiting for questions to come in, which I'm sure there will be. But, um, you know, you, you, you've given this, uh, this talk, which is excellent. But in respect, you, you've intimated that there are about three clinical trials that are positive, And there's numerous trials that are negative. So where do we stand? I mean, this is a typical scenario of choose what you want, or how do you get us through this quagmire? Well, I, I think really um, the answer is we, we've now, the Simplicity Hypertension 3 trial was a pivotal neutral trial. Up until then, uh, all the trials and studies demonstrated an enormous reduction in blood pressure. And then uh, the Simplicity Hypertension 3 trial was the first trial that had a sham control because that was mandated by the FDA in the United States. And I remember when I first saw the data, I was on, I chaired the Data Safety Monitoring Board. And we saw the first cut of the data, which showed no change in blood pressure at all. 
and there's absolute silence in the room. It's not what anybody expected. It was actually meant to be a safety trial, really. Uh, we all assumed that, that there was efficacy. So this large the first trial with the sham control demonstrated no benefit. Subsequently, there was a great deal of soul searching as to why we had a neutral trial after all these positive studies. And a number of aspects were re-examined, including the whole question of placebo, the Hawthorne effect, but there were technical issues too. And so that led to a real, uh, um, a whole series of trials with a different catheter, different procedural aspects. And the other thing that I think was really important was to do a, a trial in people off drugs. This, this was really critical. And so after quite, again, a, a period of soul searching, it was decided uh, from a number of different sources that it would be ethical to take people with mild to moderate hypertension and allow drugs to wash out and then do a trial comparing renal denervation uh, to placebo in people who were not on antihypertensive therapy. This was for a period of three to six months. Three of those trials are now positive. And I think the key question is how positive? Um, the reduction in <clears throat> ambulatory blood pressure is somewhere around about, I think, five to eight millimeters of mercury. And the question is, is that enough? Now, uh, sorry, Bertie, to interrupt you there, but they're coming in fast and furious now, and I'd like to get as many of these to you as possible. In, in no particular order, I'll try to take the earlier ones first. Why are the kidneys innovated uh, is one, and what, are the, what is the risks of denervation? Quick answers, we can get through a lot, Bernard. Yeah, I'm not sure why, why the kidneys are innovated. Uh, they are innovated, and sympathetic nervous system activity seems to play... Um, uh, an important role in the regulation of blood pressure, including the renal regulation of blood pressure. Um, in terms of safety, the one thing we've learned so far is it's safe. Another one, uh, did all the patients in the recent trials have adherence to medication? Was there well, some, checked? Um, some, of the trials, some of the trials were off medication, and then some have been on medication. And uh, I think adherence has been good. But I think the important trials are the ones off medication, because that really was the proof of concept. OK, uh, there's one from Dr. Patel in London <clears throat> who says, um, in reality, are we treating hypertensive patients well enough? Were patients in the on trial on good medications, sorry, coming back to medications, at appropriate dose and sodium intake, et cetera, optimized? I can't answer about sodium in, intake, but um, uh, I believe that they were well treated with good medications. And because it was a trial, uh, people are pretty adherent and they measured it. Okay, um, there's a, another question from, from Charlie Thompson in Morpeth, the United Kingdom. And he says, um, Sprint has taught us the importance of standardized blood pressure measurements in trials. How was the blood pressure measured in the recent trials of renal denervation? Was measurement uh, properly standardized? Ways, ambulatory 24 hour. Uh, the primary endpoint was ambulatory 24 hour blood pressures, but there were also um, measurements of office blood pressure. I don't know whether um, exactly the details of how they measured blood pressure in the office, whether it was three or five measurements. I think in Sprint it was five measurements, but. Um, so it is measured both ways, ambulatory BP and office BP. Uh, another question that's come through, which is, um, I, I don't know how to phrase this, uh, what state of mind the person was in, but I think it sounds could be angry. Uh, if this were a drug, would we still be trialing it? There you go. That silenced you, Bernard. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, 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 it, it's an excellent question. And um, the, the honest answer is, I don't know. I think we would still be trialing it because here's the problem, that there's um, 
a tremendous variability in responses, both to denovation and to the placebo. And that, I think, is one of the key unresolved questions. Why do some people get a 25 millimeter drop and others don't? So although if this was a drug, we would be able to say, on balance, this drug is effective. Um, I still feel we need to know a great deal more about who responds and who doesn't respond. And here's the difference between a procedure and a drug. A drug is very easy to take. This is not that simple a procedure. Okay, um, I'm delighted that uh, we've got a question from Ian Manown from Northern Ireland. And Ian says, uh, as we denovate more extensively in the latest trials, is there any signal of orthostatic effect emerging? I know of individual cases, again, a, a very good question. I, I do know of um, anecdotal cases of people who uh, did become orthostatic. But and um, but I don't know that in the trials we have measurements of orthostatism as such. What we do know is the original surgical procedure in the 1950s, which was um, uh, an extensive sympathectomy, led to intolerable orthostatic hypotension. Okay, uh, I think we could time for one or two more. Um, another question, I'm not sure where this is from. Any place for uh, denovation outside clinical trials yet? If so, where? No, I think what we do need are additional trials to look at the effect of denovation in um, uh, atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmias, heart failure, sleep apnea, but it's, to my mind at the moment, uh, renal, renal denovation is still um, a, a procedure that should be performed in a trial setting. And I, I, I give a lot of credit to the FDA in the US for um, uh, refusing to re, re, um, approve this procedure until there were sham control trials. Now, I do think in the coming year, we will probably see that the procedure is approved. How, how widely taken up it'll be, we don't know. But I do know that an, um, uh, approval is an approval hearing is scheduled for this year. Okay, Bernard, what about, um, is a question, uh, what about baroreceptor activators? Well, there, there, there is a technique of baroreceptor stimulation for hypertension uh, that's still, at best of my knowledge, under investigation. I think we probably just, I'm waiting for a signal from somebody, but they seem to have left us alone in this room, John. Um, anything you would like to add to Bernard? Well, I could just make one comment about the, de the completeness of denovation and the concern that if you do it too much, you might end up in trouble. Um, and in the old days in nephrology, we used to do bilateral nephrectomies on patients sometimes uh, as the only way of controlling their severe hypertension. And they ended up with a degree of lability of blood pressure uh, that was quite volume dependent, unsurprisingly. Um, but it wasn't necessarily catastrophic. I do know that there's an ongoing trial at the moment uh, looking at lesser degrees of denervation in terms of uh, you know, the, the pivotal sp spiral trial. I think about 40 sites were ablated per patient. And there's an ongoing trial right now looking at whether fewer sites can be ablated with the same effect. Questions coming through, which we will go on if you don't mind, Bernard. We've got a few seconds oh, left. Sorry. With variable, res variable responses, were dippers and non-dippers included in the renal denervation trials? Yes, they were. Um, if one looks at the data on the ambulatory 24-hour blood pressure monitoring, what you see is that the reduction in blood pressure applies at night as well as in, uh, in the day. Uh, I don't believe that patients were selected on the basis of whether they were dippers or non-dippers, but certainly the benefits in terms of the reduction of blood pressure were seen over a full 24-hour period, which includes nighttime dipping. I think the big question that we've still got to answer is 
how much is enough? Is, is five, seven millimeters of blood pressure reduction enough? Uh, epidemiologically, it is. If you did it in 10 million people, a seven millimeter reduction in blood pressure is enough. But what about for the individual patient? They'll still probably have to be on a drug, many of them. Okay, and let's have a final question, I think. How permanent is the procedure? Will it need repetition if it was ever successful? Great used? question. We don't know. And uh, what I think will be difficult is, is to really determine the duration of efficacy. I mean, you can get re-innovation. We've seen that with cardiac transplants. And I think this is one of the uh, unresolved issues, and that is how do we assess the durability of efficacy? Are we going to have, take a patient and go through the whole period of drug washout and then see whether their blood pressure is uh, controlled or not, I, I don't know. Uh, can I just uh, have the last question here, other than thanking you, and that is, you know, this subject has been around for a little while now. If you were to re predict five, ten years' time, what do you think will be the outcome? That's a great question, Derek. I, I, I think that the procedure will probably be approved for clinical use in the United States. I think it is used clinically in, in, in Europe, but it, I think it will be approved. But what will be, remains to be determined is uh, how much will it be utilized? Um, I hear that there are surveys of patients and that the response is if they could have renal denervation and be on one less drug, they would be happy to do that. But we'll have to see what the uptake of this is clinically. So I think it'll be approved it does reduce blood pressure but what its utilization will be i don't know bernard uh, as always uh, many thanks for a fantastic talk and hope to see you again live soon <laughs> thank you thank you very much it's always a pleasure to be part of this great meeting even virtually thank you and i'm handing over to john cunningham now for the next presentation thank you derek um <clears throat> Now, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Sharon Moe. Um, Sharon is the Director of the Division of Nephrology at Indiana University School of Medicine. She has an extremely distinguished career, uh, so distinguished I don't have time to go through all the, the major achievements, but one of which I will mention. She's a past president of the American Society of Nephrology, uh, uh, as well, well as holding many other accolades. She spent a good part of her academic uh, uh, career trying to draw together the ubiquitous mineral and bone disorder, MBD, and cardiovascular disease as we see it in uh, patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, uh, both these are highly prevalent, and the uh, topic that we've given her is to try and draw this together uh, by addressing the matter of kidney, heart, and bone. Does the crosstalk help or hinder? Uh, Sharon. Hello, I'm Dr. Sharon Moe from Indiana University School of Medicine, and I'm here today to talk about the kidney, the heart, and bone, and the crosstalk between these organs. So we routinely measure coronary calcification using CT methods, outlining the density of an artery that is similar to the density of bone. This is considered a surrogate for atherosclerotic calcification or atherosclerotic disease, where calcification occurs early in the course of the changes and eventually resulting to plaque vulnerability, rupture, and myocardial infarction. Medial calcification can also occur, and especially in disease states such as CKD and diabetes. These are two pictures of the inferior epigastric artery taken at the time of a kidney transplant. The calcification shown in black is in the medial layer on both of these particular arteries, and the one on the right is almost damaging the entire artery. The intima is thickened in the one on my right, and no changes in the intima on the one on the left. The epidemiology of artery bone crosstalk is that we know there is increased atherosclerosis, cardiac mortality, and vascular calcification with aging. Multiple studies have shown there's also increased bone loss and fractures with aging. 
But the greater the progression of vascular calcification, the greater the magnitude of bone loss in longitudinal studies. But association does not equal causality. So what information do we have that actually truly shows a link between these organs? Well, this is a very interesting study that was just published by a group in Denmark. They did five, six nephrectomies on rats to give them kidney disease, fed them high phosphorus diet, vitamin D, with the result of having diffuse and severe aortic vascular calcification. They then transplanted that calcified aorta into normal rats, group three here, and they also transplanted normal aortas into normal rats, group two. And the result was that the animals that received the calcified aorta transplant had decreased bone density compared to the animals that received a normal aorta transplant. They also took these calcified aortas and normal aortas and they put them in a petri dish and they saw that they secreted sclerostin. Well, what is sclerostin? It's actually a bone derived protein and in the osteocytes in the bone actually make sclerostin and that sclerostin inhibits osteoblast differentiation and bone formation and stimulates osteoclastic bone resorption. So the net effect of decreased bone formation and increased bone resorption would of course mean low bone mass. So in fact, arteries can turn into bone. So if we look at the way normal bone remodels in long bones, we have cartilage cells that proliferate, become hypertrophic, and then lay down a mineral and a matrix to get the calcification. The cell signaling pathways that happen between the resting chondrocyte the proliferative chondrocyte and the hypertrophy are shown here with RUNX2 being a major transcription factor. And in fact, if you knock out RUNX2 in an animal model, the animal fails to form any mineralized bone. We're taking those same arteries from dialysis patients getting a transplant. We saw one patient's artery that had significant calcification in the medial layer, but also in the intimal layer. Using in situ hybridization for RUNX2 expression, shown in the purple dots, you can see that there is actually a bone transcription factor being expressed near the areas of calcification in both the medial and the artery label layers. Vascular smooth muscle cells can indeed differentiate to this osteochondrogenic cell type. So normally these cells sit as a kind of contractile or quiescent cell with increased myocardial expression. Then some insult that increases the intracellular calcium of the cells turns it into a proliferative type cell. With that, there is a decreased myocardial expression. And at that point, the cells can further de-differentiate and express this RUNX2 transcription factor and turn into osteochondrocytic-like cells in the vasculature. And they do what bone cells do, they mineralize. So how is it that these vascular smooth muscle cells change to a synthetic cell? Well, many of these traditional risk factors, mediated in part by angiotensin II, can cause this synthetic switch. Then the factors on the right, the so-called non-traditional risk factors, inflammation, AGEs, hyperphosphatemia, can actually upregulate RUNX2 and lead to the osteochondrocytic cells. But the third part, to get to vascular calcification, requires abnormal mineral metabolism and or reduced calcification inhibitors. So calcium and phosphorus normally combine together, and they will actually continue to grow in the absence of an inhibitor. Pure mineral mediated changes. So the procalcifying factors are of course the cellular differentiation and then excess calcium and phosphorus as we see commonly in CKD. The inhibitors of calcification occur both in bone and in vasculature and keep us from mineralizing in unwanted places and there are many such inhibitors. One is called fetchwin and this is a circulating inhibitor made in the liver. It is an, a reverse acute phase reactant. It goes down when there is inflammation. It's like a vacuum cleaner going through your blood, picking up excess calcium and phosphorus conglomerates. In this knockout animal, you see calcification in all of the soft tissues. Matrix GLA protein is specifically expressed in the arteries, shown in red here is calcification in these knockout animals, where you see deposition of calcium in black along the elastin fibers. In addition to the inhibitors, you can also prevent that conglomeration of calcium and phosphorus from extending, and that's what this novel drug does. In a study in hemodialysis patients where they infused it three times weekly, over one year there was a reduction in the progression of coronary calcification in the drug-treated group, 
and a marked reduction in aortic valve progression of calcification. So to summarize the etiology of vascular calcification, in category one, which is the inflammatory atherosclerotic change, it, lo it is located in the entoma. In category two, where we see in chronic kidney disease or diabetes, it's in the media. Genetic changes in these various factors I talked about is also in the media. All of these have gain of activators, loss of inhibitors, and they behave like an osteogenic type process. Importantly, the consequence of this is vascular stiffness. When you have an artery that is not pliable, then the pulse pressure is increased, leading to LVH. In addition, in the inflammatory atherosclerotic lesions, it leads to plaque vulnerability. Thus, vascular calcification can cause multiple cardiac events. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Great talk, as usual. And, and just nailed that one. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we've got some questions coming in um, for you, and I've got one or two as well, um, which I might throw at you in a minute. But here's one from uh, a member of the audience, which is, um, uh, says, are there any data on sclerostin antagonists and effects on arteries? It's a great question. It um, is a great question. The, <laughs> and thank you again for inviting me today. Um, so we actually used our slowly progressive rat model and gave anti-sclerostin antibody, and we did not see an effect on arterial calcification. So there was a trend towards lowering when there was a low PTH um, and an improvement in bone volume with a low PTH. But when the PTH was high, we didn't see anything. So it's likely that um, CKD may basically override or elevated PTH may override the effects of sclerostin. No human studies that I know of. And I suppose the other issue is, is there, there's a theoretical reason, is there not, for thinking that it may accelerate vascular calcification? Um, I think it's because of its Wnt inhibition, and there is ideas that the Wnt is protective. Um, but I, th I just don't think that that's based in enough data to actually say that there might be pro-calcification effects. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, OK. Um, so I've got a further question for you, and that is, in nephrology, we've, we've always struggled to demonstrate interventions improving outcomes. We can show improvement of various surrogate markers um, much more easily, um, but the outcome data are too often disappointing. Why do you think we've struggled on this so much? Well, I think we tend to, um, you know, when the kidneys fail, we tend to study dialysis patients for convenience purposes because we see them three times a week, so it's easy to keep enrollment. But it's a complicated pathophysiology. So we, we, we take one aspect of the uremic milieu and we target it and in, we don't account for all the rest of them. So personally, I think we need combination therapies for these patients to really show any kind of an endpoint efficacy in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. Um, the other option is that, you know, particularly it may be too much too late. So by the time a patient reaches dialysis, you know, 80% of them have significant coronary calcification. Um, they have extreme problems with vascular disease, cardiac disease, et cetera. So it may be that it's just the wrong uh, process um, or the wrong patient population to study. And we really have not had large, large trials. I mean, Evolve was the only one that was big enough and that struggled with uh, drop-ins. So there's another question here talking about the pleiotropic effects of vitamin D, um, including on potentially vascular inflammation. What are your thoughts on this? That's from Dr. Sundi Patel uh, in London. Well, I wish I had a clear, ac a clear answer on that because the literature is extremely mixed. Um, everything from um, benefit to harm. Uh, the harm is likely to be in vivo because of its effects on mineral metabolism, so increasing the calcium and the phosphorus. There is some evidence that vitamin D affects clotho in human arteries, but that cannot be repeated in rodent arteries, which may be just differences in clotho expression. Um, so I think there's likely that vitamin D is more toxic than helpful when it comes to vascular disease. That's, that's interesting. Um, there's now a question here on the role of FGF23 in kidney, heart, and bone interactions, uh, to which I could add also, what do you think might be the possibilities if we learn how to manipulate FGF23 uh, with therapeutic interventions? <clears throat> so FGF23 levels are 
astronomically high in patients who are aneuric with kidney disease. And part of that thought is that there is resistance at the level of the parathyroid gland and at the level of the kidney, what's left of the kidney because of clotho down regulation. So I honestly think that even if we blocked the FGF23, um, we may see some efficacy in the heart where there is no clotho dependency, but in the kidneys and the parathyroid, um, you're going to need clotho there, and that's going to be um, impossible to reproduce. So it may be that we have to give combination therapies. Again, I think that's a drug that we should do very early in the course of um, of dialysis, where the urine is not so important. But I I, uh, I, I tell you, we we need to to move on that hormone because it does do a lot of things. But I think studying it in isolation in animals is not the way to do it. I think we have to look at the systemic effects in rodent models um, and with and without uh, soluble clotho. Okay. Um, so another question here, um, is vascular calcification reversible, um, particularly in the context of renal transplantation? Actually, there are several studies. Um, we did one way back and uh, several repeated studies that it is not reversible. And one of the reasons that it's not reversible, as in bone remodeling, you actually have osteoclasts that will come by and resorb the bone. But in atherosclerotic or medial calcification, there's only limited case reports of, athros of uh, osteoclast-like activity. So there's really nothing to actually um, demineralize that bone. And when you look at mineral, the first phase is called brush eye, and that's when it's reversible. But once it forms hydroxyapatite, it has to actually be enzymatically broken down, and that's why it's not reversible. Uh, now a question looking at the connection between vascular calcification and prognosis. Now, we know there are strong associations there, uh, but if you can do something that either removes it or stops it developing, does that ne intervention necessarily improve prognosis? I have to believe in my heart of hearts that it will, um, but we do not have the data to support that. Um, so part of the problem has been the study designs that have assessed that. The best design we have are in patients uh, new to dialysis called the RIND study that Jeff Block followed for five years, where um, slowing the progression of coronary calcification clearly improved mortality, but it was a, a very small study. Um, others have failed to attempt to look at that. And part of that is because if you have 80% of people starting dialysis with heavy burden of calcification, finding that group where you're going to actually differ, I think differentiate those who are going to not progress versus others who uh, progress may be harder. It's a narrower uh, therapeutic window, so to speak. Um, thank you. The question now from uh, Dr. Rina Pradden in Boston, who in fact is speaking later uh, this morning. Um, have there been efforts to evaluate these therapies in preventing lower extremity peripheral vascular disease progression? Well, the last uh, uh, drug that I showed you on uh, the, the small talk here was, uh, is actually undergoing a study looking at peripheral artery calcification as we speak. They're just starting to enroll. So yeah. I, think, well, I think that's really an important question because you know, I've collected arteries from patients for years and years, and the arteries we get from patients undergoing amputation are extensively calcified. Okay, now here's an interesting one. Do you see a utility for vitamin K2 in terms of preventing vascular calcification? Well, um, in the, the longer talk, I go through that a little bit more, but I do think there's potentially a role because that would actually keep your uh, matrix GLA protein, that inhibitory protein, active. The, um, there are at least, I think, five ongoing trials looking at coronary artery calcification um, prevention with K2 uh, drugs. So hopefully one of them will show us some effect. All of them, unfortunately, are just looking at calcification and no, um, no long-term endpoints. But I think that's the first step. If we can't change the calcification through this inhibition of matrix GLA protein, then it's unlikely that we would see a huge benefit down the road. And um, another question now, have anti-osteoporotic drugs been shown to decrease arterial calcification? We, we talked about romosozumab no, just now, which may increase it in theory, but this yeah, is looking at the theory, other way yes. around. And again, I think this points out to the fact that, that most of the osteoporotic agents are aimed at stopping bone resorption. So bisphosphonates and other agents, for example, all affect the um, osteoclast activity. Um, denosumab is through inhibition through the ring ligand. Um, so 
but in arterial calcification, again, we don't get that resorption, we're only getting formation. And so that's why the drugs that are considered anabolic, meaning those that increase formation, so the antiscleroscin antibodies, the PTH are of concern that they might actually in, you know, increase calcification. Um, so it, that's why I kind of go into talking about the bone. If you don't really understand the, the, the cycle of bone remodeling in bone versus arteries, then I think we draw erroneous conclusions about the links. Okay, well, I think that's going to be it. There are a lot more questions, in fact, but we're not going to have time to move on to them, I'm afraid. Um, okay. A measure of your quality of your talk, Sharon. And thanks very much again. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, and I appreciate all the great talks here and being part of this wonderful symposium. Good, I'm glad to enjoy it. Okay, thank take you. care. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm going to hand back now to my co-chair, uh, Stephanie Baldwin. Hello, I'm uh, Stephanie Baldwin. I'm a diabetologist endocrinologist at University College London. I am co-chairing this session with Professor Mark Pfeffer. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce the first speaker, who is Professor Sonia Anand uh, from the McMaster University in Canada. Uh, professor Anand is a professor of medicine and epidemiology at McMaster's uh, and a senior scientist at the Population Health Research Unit Institute. She uh, has a, a, an interest in ethnic diversity in cardiovascular disease, she focuses in her research upon the environmentally and genetic determinants of vascular disease in populations, and she's currently leading two large cohort studies, one uh, looking at the health of South Asian women of the greater Toronto area, and secondly looking at cardiovascular health among indigenous women from the Six Nations Reserve. It is therefore my great pleasure to introduce you to her talk, uh, titled Clotting at the Limits, the NOAC Generation. Thank you very much, Dr. Anand. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today via video. And today I will describe some of the new and exciting ways that we are using novel or direct oral anticoagulant medications. And as someone who practices in the field of thrombosis, it has really been a revolution in terms of the therapies we use to treat patients with venous as well as arterial thrombosis. We used to have two options, intravenous heparin and warfarin. And over the past 25 years, we now have added to our toolbox low molecular weight heparins that are injectable, uh, as well as direct 10A and 2A inhibitors, parenteral and most recently oral options in this area. And this has revolutionized our management of patients with venous thrombosis from uh, our original uh, requirement of treating patients in hospital to now treating many patients as outpatients who have serious thrombosis. And this demonstrates for you 25 years ago, if I had a patient with a DVT, PE, or acute coronary syndrome, those patients had to be admitted to hospital and were started on an intravenous heparin infusion with a transition to warfarin targeting an INR of two to three. And today, with the large randomized trials that have demonstrated the benefit of direct oral anticoagulants, our outpatient management of patients with thrombosis has changed pretty dramatically. So here in the slide, you will see a patient with a deep vein thrombosis on ultrasound. Uh, these patients could also have a pulmonary embolism shown on the CTPA. I see these patients in the emergency room and I can prescribe a direct oral anticoagulant and treat them as outpatients if their conditions are not too severe. Now, if we think about our uh, memory from medical school of the coagulation cascade, we can see where these new medications operate. So in green, you will see the intravenous heparin affecting the 10A to 2A ratio, uh, 
modification of unfractionated heparin to the low molecular weight heparins, again moving from intravenous requirement to subcutaneous uh, treatment with low molecular weight heparins. And then we can look at the individual clotting factors that are impacted by parenteral and oral direct anticoagulants such as factor 2A or thrombin. So the direct thrombin inhibitors that have been tested and used either as intravenous or subcutaneous are argatroban, uh, bivalirudin, and heriodin, for example, and the oral uh, inhibitor of thrombin being dabigatran uh, that has been shown to be effective across a number of thrombotic conditions. Uh, we also see the parenteral factor 10A inhibitor with fondoparinox and its equivalents in terms of oral factor 10A inhibitors such as rivaroxaban and apixaban. So it shows you that over the years with research we have moved from inhibiting these clotting factors as a group, such as with warfarin, uh, as well now we are using oral inhibitors of single factors or combinations of factors. And the conditions that we have phase three randomized trials to help us treat in with direct oral anticoagulants include deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, stroke prevention, cancer-associated thrombosis, and other venous thromboses. There are certain conditions where we do not use DOACs because randomized trials have demonstrated to us that in fact, we are not successful at preventing thrombosis. That would be the case of mechanical valves. In some conditions, we have best data showing that warfarin is the most effective, such as patients with LV thrombus. And other conditions, such as antiphospholipid antibodies, have actually had randomized trials comparing warfarin to DOACs, and warfarin appears to be more effective. So, we need more research, perhaps with newer uh, direct oral anticoagulants for these uh, additional conditions for which we currently still use warfarin. Now this is a busy slide but shows you the most commonly used oral direct anticoagulants, uh, which include dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. And you can see the conditions for which we have good evidence that these medications are effective, atrial fib, venous thromboembolism, uh, stroke, and more recently, peripheral artery disease, which I'll come to in a moment. The evidence when we compare DOACs to warfarin, this is an example from atrial fibrillation, really show we have equal, if not slightly superior benefit of the DOACs in terms of reducing thrombotic events, shown here is stroke and recurrent fatal stroke. In addition, the question is always, what about bleeding? And the real benefits of DOACs is that we see efficacy is there, but we also see reduced risk of severe or fatal bleeding, such as intracranial hemorrhage, across the board with these DOACs. So that is a re really attractive feature of the, using the DOACs over warfarin. We do have reversal agents for some of the most commonly used DOACs. Shown here is Ida Rasozikmab, which is a monoclonal antibody used uh, in patients on dabigatran who have experienced uh, life-threatening or severe bleeding. It's available in the United States, Canada, and Europe, as well as Dexanet Alpha is being tested uh, for use in the, of factor 10A associated bleeding also uh, being shown to be efficacious and approvals are uh, currently there in the United States and Europe and some randomized trials are still ongoing. We can use prothrombin cell concentrate if these agents are not used, but the efficacy of prothrombin cell concentrate is not as well demonstrated. Now with peripheral artery disease, I'll draw your attention to two trials that have used one quarter of a full dose of a DOAC, in this case rivaroxaban together with aspirin, demonstrating its efficacy in patients with PAD. 
And these uh, trials have really shown that if we use an antithrombin agent, an anti-factor 10 agent, we can prevent the generation of thrombin together with an antiplatelet agent prevents platelet activation. And when used together, we've shown in both the COMPASS and the Voyager trial that we can reduce major adverse cardiovascular events and major adverse limb events in patients with PAD. So this has really been a revolution in our management of patients with PAD. And now finally, the concluding slide will just demonstrate the real benefits of DOACs. They have changed our care such that we can manage severe thrombosis as outpatients. Bleeding appears to be lower with DOACs compared to warfarin. We do have reversal agents, and there are certain conditions we keep in mind where we can't use DOACs. More recently, low-dose DOAX, one quarter of a full dose used together with aspirin, are effective in patients with chronic stable vascular disease. And we await future research and randomized trials for newer compounds such as factor 11 inhibitors. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Very much, Professor Sonia Anand, for an excellent talk. Uh, very much uh, updating us on our, uh, updating our knowledge on clotting, showing us the newest data. That's been very, very uh, illuminative. Thank you. I've, I'm wait while I'm waiting for questions. I've, I just wondered whether you wanted to elaborate a bit more in the in the latter part of your talk. You were discussing lower dose of NOAC with antiplatelet agents as a really a new strategy of uh, preventing peripheral artery disease. Uh, and I wonder whether you would like to tell us a bit more about that. Sure, thank you. Uh, as you know, and I mentioned, I showed a slide that detailed all the different trials in patients with PAD from the perspective of an antithrombotic strategy. And really, there have been many, but up until the last three years, we relied on a single antiplatelet agent in our management with PAD. And the two large trials, COMPASS and Voyager, then tested a dual pathway strategy, which added low-dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice daily, which is a factor 10A inhibitor, so an anticoagulant, together with aspirin as an antiplatelet, and that combination was very effective at preventing the MACE outcomes as well as the limb outcomes, and the bleeding risk, although present, did not uh, lead to life-threatening or severe bleed, so an improvement over prior trials, and it's really revolutionized our management of PAD patients because now we can offer them something more potent than aspirin because there's such a high risk uh, patient population. So this was quite an advance in particular for PAD patients. Thank you. We, so I'm a diabetologist and we always, the guidance over the years is coming and going on using aspirin in patients with type two diabetes who have no other risk factors but just diabetes. What are your thoughts on this? Well, in the absence of uh, cardiovascular disease, you mean solely diabetes in terms of prevention, I think that we have a number of trials that demonstrate uh, certainly the efficacy of an antiplatelet agent, but also some other trials that may suggest that intensifying antithrombotic or antiplatelet therapy with uh, two antiplatelet agents may be indicated in our highest risk diabetics who do not have clinical coronary or vascular disease yet are on the high uh, end of the spectrum from the perspective of poorly controlled hemoglobin A1C as well as dyslipidemia, abdominal obesity. So standard of care, still single antiplatelet agent in primary prevention in a patient with diabetes. If they move into the realm of clinical cardiovascular disease, then certainly we've seen in the DOAC trials and the low-dose DOAC aspirin trials that diabetics are one of the highest risk groups and they do benefit from this low-dose DOAC antiplatelet combination. So that would be moving them into the secondary prevention realm. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. We've got a question from 
Dr. Charlie Thompson uh, from the UK. Uh, and the question is, would the risk benefit of DOACs have been even better if the monitoring of the effectiveness of the effectiveness in the lab had been developed. So if laboratory monitoring of the effectiveness had been developed is a question. Yeah, I think one of the, the best uh, features of the DOACs um, ha have been the freedom from regular monitoring uh, as opposed to warfarin where we're really bound to monitor the INR on a regular basis. And that's quite difficult for patients and also patient variability is much greater in terms of the anticoagulant effect than it is with the DOAC. So it's actually been great that in our trials we've demonstrated without monitoring an overall treatment benefit. There are some higher risk groups or groups who weren't included in the trials where this type of monitoring uh, anti-factor 10A levels is useful. So you may know in clinical practice if we have very obese individuals who were not included in trials or elderly patients or patients who are on a medication that may interact with a factor 10A inhibitor or 2A inhibitor, uh, that it is useful to be able to measure levels or anticoagulant effects. But I would say that those patients are the minimum uh, as opposed to the majority. So these tests are available in specialized centers but I don't think we need them in kind of the broader population. And in fact, the fact that we can use these drugs without regular monitoring is one of the benefits of the DOACs compared to warfarin. Thank you. There's a question on patients on dialysis and whether there are any more trials planned because many of them have been excluded in the current uh, data. Yeah, that is a very good question as well. And uh, there are likely one or two trials underway. Um, we can, and a number of us do, uh, use uh, apixaban um, in dialyzed patients. It's really more a conversation with your uh, treating nephrologists and the patient's risk. And we do find that uh, we can use some of the DOACs, in particular the ones I've used have been apixaban, uh, usually at the lower dose of 2.5 milligrams BID uh, together with a good dis discussion of the treating nephrologist. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, one question is what is so different in the pathophysiology of metallic valve thrombosis? Why do the DOACs not work? Yeah, there's a, you know, the contact factor of the blood with a metallic surface uh, is an important determinant of thrombosis. And so warfarin is effective at preventing the thrombin generation when blood interacts with the metallic surface, whereas the DOACs to date, so the anti-10As and the anti-2As, have not been effective at doing that. Now, there are uh, some uh, newer uh, DOACs being developed, such as the 11A inhibitors that may overcome the, the uh, limitation of the factor 10A and 2A inhibitors, but they will have to be tested in vitro studies and early studies are ongoing, then they'll have to move to the larger trial. So it's something about the metal contact with uh, blood that is, you know, leads to thrombosis and it is not inhibited by the DOACs to date. And would you be able to talk about the failure rate of the DOACs? Uh, you did mention it in your talk a bit, but just uh, elaborate. The failure rates in, in specific populations of patients? I think it's a general question, but I suppose it is really saying the high yeah. risk. I mean, broadly speaking, the DOACs, if we take something like atrial fibrillation or venous thromboembolism, uh, have been as efficacious as warfarin and in some trials slightly more efficacious compared to warfarin. Uh, the real benefit is, again, not monitoring, and then a lower incidence of the life-threatening bleedings, including intracranial hemorrhage. So anyone who's used warfarin, we're very fearful of that. Sometimes the intracranial hemorrhage or life-threatening bleeds occur in patients who have 
INRs in the therapeutic range, and we can't understand why that occurred. So the fact that we have a lower severe bleeding signal with the DOAX and say atrial fib and venous thromboembolism is, is very uh, welcomed because we want to avoid that most serious complication. So I would say, you know, not all thromboses are prevented by DOAX, just like they're not with warfarin, but DOAX seem to be at least as good, if not better in some situations, at preventing thrombosis. And, um, and you know, the, the indications where trials have been done and shown that DOAX are not as effective are the ones I highlighted on my slide, it includes patients with uh, mechanical valves, as well as antiphospholipid antibodies. So again, I would put a plug for, we need to have randomized trials to really understand the risk benefit profile of DOAX versus warfarin. Lovely, so I think that's really an excellent point to end for us, uh, which I think really what you're saying, we need more trials to be uh, work out which which cohorts uh, things apply to, yeah, I, as well as having an individualized approach for the patient, for example, on dialysis, so on. Yeah, and, and I think we've learned that, that we can't just extrapolate from one set of trials to another condition. As we learned from mechanical valves, that, you know, actually that led to valve thrombosis and same with antiphospholipid antibodies. So we, we really do need these trials and the different types of patients who present with thrombotic risk. Lovely. So, uh, Professor Sonia Anand, thank you very much for your excellent talk and the very, very helpful, interesting Q&A. I would like to thank the audience for their brilliant questions. There's many more apologies for this, that we could have a whole symposium on clotting. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to my co-chair, Professor Mark Pfeffer, who will introduce the next speaker. Mark, please. Thank you, Stephanie. And Stephanie, I'm going to ask you to handle the questions for the next one because I didn't see any of the questions to Sonia. I do have to thank Sonia for bringing us up to date for 25 years of a very complex field. Actually, it's the reason most of us didn't go into hematology because it's so complicated, but thank you. <laughs> and with that, yeah. I, I do want to introduce my colleague, my colleague Aruna Pradhan, who is a uh, uh, preventive medicine and cardiologist uh, and works with us at our VA and is an expert in, in, in imaging and is also a clinical trialist. So she has all the cards and she's taken on the toughest problem to bring a topic that we used to always have in our, in our titles for this, these lectures. Are we at the limits? So really that pushes you. Are we at the limits for lipid lowering? And I know she's leading a trial, but she's going to tell us more. Aruna, are we at the limits? Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to be talking about whether we've reached the limits of lipid lowering therapy and what's next on the horizon. Shown here are my disclosures. Now, I think we can squarely say that these established uh, therapies, statins, acetamide, and now PCSK9 inhibitors, are, have squarely uh, crossed the evidence threshold to be considered uh, bona fide therapies that reduce cardiovascular risk. And they all work through increased LDL receptor upregulation and thereby increasing uh, LDL uptake. Now, we've come to expect a certain cardiovascular event reduction for uh, each millimole per LDL reduction. That's shown here on the Oxford curves in blue for azetamide, black for statins, and then the PCSK9 trials, both the, de the developmental trials, Odyssey and Osler, as well as the long-term trials, Fourier and Inspire, uh, shown here. Uh, and overall about a 23% risk reduction if you're on the curve for each millimole per liter uh, LDL reduction. Uh, though if you look at the benefits in the long-term trials, we have to wonder with smaller risk reductions in those trials, about 15%, whether PCSK9 inhibitors fall below the mark. There have been some post-talk analyses to try to recalibrate for the duration of treatment, those trials lasting two to three years. And you can see when that is done, in fact, uh, those outcome trials do 
fall back on the curve and confer the expected risk reduction in terms of uh, correlation with LDL reduction. But we must ask whether there are other potential explanations, in particular, whether there's less benefit at lower levels of achieved LDL when you get to very low levels, is there diminishing returns, whether there less, is less benefit in statin-treated patients that have had chronic long-term uh, statin uh, therapy. Uh, and whether there's some high response variability to PCSK9 inhibitors that may account for this effect. And lastly, whether the lack of anti-inflammatory effects has uh, some sort of influence on the total uh, risk reduction achieved. And that's shown here, if we compare uh, the Fourier and Odyssey outcomes trials, purely LDL lowering reduction trials to newer uh, uh, inflammation uh, reduction trials, Colcott and Ladoco recently published, and examine their cumulative event curves, what you see is that for LDL reduction, there is a somewhat delayed benefit that occurs around one year of follow-up. But with the inflammation reduction trials, there's immediate separation of these cumulative event uh, reduction curves, suggesting there's additional benefit uh, that can occur with inflammation reduction on top of LDL reduction. Now we do have newer LDL lowering therapies coming uh, onto play into play now, bempedoic acid and glycerin and ivanicumab, which I've gone through in some more detail in the longer presentation. In some cases, these have dramatic LDL lowering, uh, 50 to 60 percent, and then also in some cases, uh, in particular with bempedoic acid, a concurrent anti-inflammatory effect with lowering of C-reactive protein. So we'll be waiting for those long-term outcome studies uh, for results there. Let's look at triglycerides and uh, recognize that when you measure triglyceride levels, uh, we're measuring the total triglyceride mass, but we don't really have information on the triglyceride distribution among the various lipid particles. And that may be important in terms of the conferred uh, risk uh, for cardiovascular events in individual patients. We have emerging evidence uh, from both genetic studies and, uh, and uh, uh, more physiologic studies suggesting that these triglyceride-rich particles, once digested, lipolized, uh, do penetrate the arterial intimal wall and do get in to promote the same atherogenic process uh, that uh, occurs with uh, hypercholesterolemia uh, uh, in the case of high LDL levels. And we've been here before in terms of uh, classes of medications that reduce triglycerides in clinical trials. Shown here are the fibrate trials, the major fibrate trials, the niacin trials, and the EPA uh, trial, the JELUS trial that was published a few years ago. Um, and what you can see on the left-hand side of this uh, slide is that while there are some modest reductions some trials showing significant benefit in particular HHS and VA HIT for the fibrate trials, no benefit with the niacin trials, and some uh, benefit with the EPA trial, uh, JELUS trial. The more dramatic uh, observation may be that their greatest benefits are th in those patients with high triglyceride levels. If you limit uh, the analysis to those patients with hypertriglyceridemia, across the board, significant uh, risk reductions in that subgroup. And we now have three cardiovascular outcome trials that have selected for hypertriglyceridemia uh, in, in terms of their inclusion and use triglyceride lowering therapies, uh, reduce it strength and prominent, which is projected to uh, uh, be out in 2022. Reduce it and strength have already uh, reported, and these use high dose purified uh, omega 3 fatty acids, international trials, having about a 20% reduction in triglyceride lowering. And let's go through those very briefly. Of course, the Reduce It trial was really a blockbuster when it came out in 2019, and you can see dramatic reductions with a high dose of cosipen ethyl compared to placebo about a 25% risk reduction over the five-year period of uh, follow-up in this clinical trial. What was somewhat surprising is that the achieved triglyceride levels did not predict the outcome. There was less linkage, in fact, as you see here in these curves, no linkage with the achieved triglyceride levels and uh, the risk reduction achieved. It didn't seem to matter how low uh, the triglyceride levels got to in terms of who was likely to benefit from the therapy. And this 
probably should come as no surprise because when we look back at the VA hit and Helsinki heart studies, uh, that was the same situation there. The achieved triglyceride levels highlighted in red here were not significantly associated with the risk benefit uh, in those two trials. So while unexplained, uh, there may be other reasons why uh, acosapet ethyl vasipa um, uh, reduces cardiovascular risk. Another area of confusion has been, uh, uh, has emerged really with results of the strength trial shown on the right-hand side, where there has been no benefit with high-dose EPA and DHA, a mixed combination of omega-3 fatty acids, and whether it's DHA that uh, neutralizes the effect of EPA is not clear, whether there's a contribution of the type of placebo used is not clear, but nonetheless, uh, the uh, risk reductions with EPA have allowed uh, for approval uh, in most countries around the world, and this agent is, is, is available for use for cardiovascular risk reduction. Let me briefly go to Prominent, uh, which is a, a trial that I've been involved with using pemifibrate, a selective PPAR-alpha agonist, a similar trial in terms of its inclusion criteria, although focusing on, on patients with type 2 diabetes. The TG lowering in that trial is about 40%, so twice uh, the TG lowering achieved with reduce it in strength, and also some benefits on other uh, markers, in particular, I'll bring your attention to triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, which were dramatically reduced, about a 40% reduction at the dose uh, being used in this trial. There are other triglyceride-lowering therapies in development, uh, and we look forward to those, uh, those agents uh, being studied in cardiovascular outcomes trials. Moving forward, I think we also need to focus on peripheral artery disease. Uh, shown on the left is the proportion of individuals living, or the number of individuals living with PAD, and you can see more individuals living with PAD and, and other major forms of cardiovascular disease is really an underappreciated uh, uh, vascular disease that we need to pay more attention to on the right really demonstrates the, the, the gaps uh, that there have been over 25 cardiovascular outcome trials of anti-diabetic agents, again, a population at high risk of PAD, but less than one third of those looking at PAD outcomes. And if we look, we may actually find a benefit. These are results from the field trial, which showed a benefit of that uh, uh, fibrate in terms of any amputation whether they were uh, minor amputations, probably having a, a more benefit, uh, and then major amputation shown here with less of a benefit. We'll be adjudicating uh, PAD outcomes in prominent to see if we can replicate uh, these findings. Sex and race, uh, I think we have to uh, consider as both social and biologic constructs. There are many social determinants of, of uh, cardiovascular health. Uh, that uh, come along with uh, sex and, and, uh, and race. Uh, some of those are shown here on this slide. There are definitely some sex-linked biologic determinants uh, and, and certainly our underrepresentation of, of these two groups of patients in our cardiovascular outcomes trials does limit our global mission uh, to achieve cardiovascular risk reduction. Now we all know about the underrepresentation of women, but I think the problem uh, is really amplified uh, for, uh, for minorities. And these are data that were just recently published uh, showing that the participation of African-Americans uh, in cardiovascular drug trials that achieved FDA approval over the past 15 years or so has been really low compared to their proportion uh, of patients that actually are afflicted with cardiovascular diseases, and that's reflected by the PPR. Shown on the left, anything below the red line is underrepresentation. Anything above the green line is overrepresentation. What's shown in the orange bars are uh, really a dramatic underrepresentation across uh, many cardiovascular uh, in, uh, uh, types of diseases. And then on the right-hand side, that we really have not achieved much movement in this area and we need to focus uh, more aggressively. If we look, uh, there may actually be important biologic differences and I've tried to highlight, highlight this here, data from the Dallas Heart Study. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side for black women, on the right-hand side for black men, those markers that seem to be higher uh, in blacks as compared to whites and those that seem to be lower and the orange uh, and uh, blacks as compared to white, similar across uh, sexes. 
What are some important differences that may have implications for who will benefit from emerging therapies? LP little a being much higher uh, in these individuals and triglycerides being somewhat lower, just to, to mention just a few. So I'll close there and uh, I'll uh, hand it over to our moderators for the discussion period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Aruna Pratan. This was an excellent talk, uh, especially interesting, I think, the racial uh, differences, possible difference in cardiovascular risk, which has been an ongoing story with insulin resistance, and clearly it uh, hasn't been fully answered yet. I would like to open the Q&A session. Uh, please do send your questions. I would like to open the session with uh, my co-chair asking the first question, uh, Professor Mark Pfeffer, please. Thank you, Stephanie. And Aruna, that was fabulous. You took the challenge. Uh, and today's physician now has to be faced with, I have to do more than just lower LDL. What an what <laughs> opportunity and challenge. So now we have to think about triglycerides. We have to think about inflammation. Uh, don't we have to think about HDL? Uh, when I went to medical school, that was an important risk factor in the opposite direction. So what's going on in that field? Yeah, thanks, Mark. A great question. Uh, I, I think that we have had a lot of investment in HDL raising therapies that haven't really come to fruition. And, and uh, the linkage between low HDL and high triglycerides have now sort of surfaced as the, the, uh, the strongest linkage uh, in dyslipidemia. Um, I, I'm not sure that we've abandoned that approach, but we've moved on uh, to other uh, other stronger strategies that, that are now supported by biology as well. Um, Stephanie, can I ask another question? You may. Uh, uh, you said we uh, now have to think about race, uh, sex. You're at the limits, and part of the at the limits, the end is nephrology. What about nephrology? Are they, we, we've somehow, uh, you know, we had two trials with, uh, with statins that didn't help people uh, on dialysis. Uh, have we abandoned treating dialysis patients with lipid lowering agents? No, I mean, I, I think um, there, there are, there are so many um, factors related to uh, chronic renal disease that uh, perpetuate atherosclerosis. So, I do think it's an important uh, group to evaluate in clinical trials. Uh, there is a, a, a very likely to be announced a clinical trial looking at anti-inflammatory therapies in, in that population as well. Very high risk group. And in the US, as the population ages, as the population uh, uh, impact of the diabetes and obesity burden uh, hits, uh, I think that's gonna be a much more important population. You're right though. I mean. I, I have to say, as I get more uh, involved in race, ethnicity as a driver, um, and I see that much of the data that we have in clinical trials of lipid lowering therapies has been extrapolated to other populations, and, and possibly uh, incorrectly so, or you know, we're really extending beyond what we've studied. Uh, it is important to look at high-risk groups. It is important to select those individuals in each of these populations that, that might warrant more aggressive therapy. Yeah. It's not cost-effective. I mean, uh, each of these clinical trials, you know, cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so uh, they need strong advocates uh, to push that science further. Well, the renal community is ready to do trials, and uh, inflammation would be a great one. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. Lovely. We've got many questions, and I'm not sure that we have as much time, but I'm going to ask uh, the question from Dr. S uh, Sandeep Patel from London, who's saying many patients have mixed dyslipidemia, uh, and do you advocate a synergistic use of statins and fibrates? Bear in mind the fibrates have gone out of fashion a bit. Yeah, that's a great question. I feel, uh, Dr. Patel, like you've just uh, thrown me a softball because we are studying uh, just that in the prominent trial. Um, the prior studies of uh, fibrates have not, uh, did not select for patients with high triglycerides, as I mentioned. Uh, in prominent, we'll be selecting for high triglycerides uh, in diabetic patients, that the population you're talking about, mixed dyslipidemia. 
Um, so we will have uh, data soon on whether or not adding a potent uh, a, a PPAR alpha or fibrate-like therapy uh, actually confers a benefit in that risk group. Right now, we don't have the evidence to support that strategy. Thank you. Uh, there's a question on uh, prescription medicine. So are we closer to genetic studies for precision prescription in this field? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I think we're still a little bit further out uh, there. I think, again, you know, that we, we talked about how we have to have, uh, we in cardiology rely a lot on the evidence, and we don't have the evidence uh, base yet, clinical trials that have selected based on genetic risk factors, uh, at least uh, uh, for the general population. We have uh, studies in FH and other uh, common genetic disorders, but not really in uh, broader populations, uh, the general population, to suggest that strategy would work yet. Question, which is quite a big question, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, I'm not sure where it's coming from. Are the differences between blacks and whites, this is all in inverted commas, which you described, are they likely due to environmental, cultural, or dietary differences, or is this a genetic difference we see? Yeah, I, I actually like that question quite a bit for two reasons. Uh, the quotation marks are important. I mean, I, I think when I speak to my international colleagues, it's very difficult challenging the terminology that we use um, as we approach studies in these individuals. It's important to engage with the communities to uh, to be very respectful of both social and biologic differences that can sometimes invoke uh, some uh, tension or difficult conversations. But um, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, uh, these race ethnic groups are very heterogeneous. There are individuals in those groups that are high resource and low resource, disadvantaged and uh, not disadvantaged. Um, and, and part of the influence, I think, is both biology and the environment. Um, it's hard to dis disentangle that. And that's why I think this area in which we are going to try to enroll more patients from that population will allow us to tease out those differences. Right now, all we have are observational studies that try to do that. Um, but uh, moving forward, I hope that we engage those communities more effectively to figure out those answers. Those are very important questions. Thank you. I have a question on the meaning of triglycerides. Uh, is the meaning of triglycerides different in uh, type 1 and type 2? So the inf influence on cardiovascular disease, I suppose, is a what the question is asking. So in difference that's, in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Yeah, that's a, a very uh, good question. Uh, you know, there, VLDL is a major component in blood that carries triglycerides, right? And so insulin resistance causes differential increase in VLDL1 and VLDL2. So triglycerides are a very crude indicator of what's happening physiologically and the preponderance of one uh, uh, triglyceride marker versus another. So in fact, there are differences uh, uh, in the underlying atherogenic lipids uh, for these types of patients, and that's reflected in, in the versions of the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins uh, that are being carried. So there are differences, and um, important to understand that. TGs may not be enough to differentiate risk. Thank you. There is one question on, do you think a lot of residual risk is there because we are not getting LDL-C uh, levels low enough? Uh, that's another good question. I think we've been pushing the limits on LDL. You know, we have a lot of uh, the PCSK9 trials that have reported. We now have uh, bempedoic acid and, and glycerin that are being studied in large cardiovascular outcomes trials, pushing levels even lower. I think I tried to illustrate that I do have, per personally do have questions about whether uh, continuing to push LDL levels uh, even further down in patients who are already on background lipid-lowering therapy may have diminishing returns. I'm not sure that uh, continuing to push this, will, will, rather than adding a different agent, uh, like an anti-inflammatory agent, like a TG-lowering agent, uh, would be more beneficial. Lovely. And then I'm going to ask one final question, which is about the management of high, lit, uh, high triglycerides. And the question is, should this really start by improving insulin resistance and reducing liver fat? Uh, so would this be more effective uh, doing this rather than going straight for the triglycerides? Uh, yeah, so uh, reducing liver fat, I, I think obesity is the big driver here, right? So if we can get our patients to diet, exercise, uh, reduce body weight, 
reduce overall adiposity, uh, I, I think that would be the most uh, least uh, uh, least invasive strategy. Um, but that's been challenging, even in the U.S., where we have structured high-intensity programs, uh, one-year-long programs to do this. There's a lot of dropout. Um, so unfortunately, without medications um, and this this more aggressive strategy, I'm not sure we'll achieve it with with less invasive approaches. Thank you very much, Professor Aruna Pradhan, for an excellent talk and a really very illuminative uh, Q&A session. I'd like to thank my co-chair, Professor Mark Pfeffer, and I'm handing over to Professor Derek Yellen. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, now, as, as many of you know or may know, these cardiology, diabetes, and nephrology at the Limits meeting have been running for the past 23 years. <clears throat> Excuse me, and they all started in 1996 when my very good friend and close colleague Professor Lionel Opie and I decided to have a meeting to commemorate the opening of the second Hatter Cardiovascular Institute at the University of Cape Town, to which he was the director. It was so successful that we continued to hold these meetings every year for the past 23 years. Unfortunately, as you may know, Lionel very sadly passed away in February 2020, just prior to the start of the pandemic. It is difficult to describe in words the huge impact that Lionel had in cardiovascular medicine around the world. He was a powerhouse of knowledge and a true giant in clinical and basic research. And there are many of us today who owe our careers and enthusiasm for research to him. Although he leaves a legacy of papers and books and memories to those of us he touched, we felt that a further means of continuing his legacy of dissemination of knowledge to which he excelled was to decide to hold an annual Lionel Opie lecture in his honor. I know that his wife, Carol, and family will be watching this afternoon, and we welcome them to this first Lionel Opie lecture. And in this regard, let me say that I'm really proud to welcome and to introduce Professor Mapika Naseki, who is the head of the Division of Cardiology at the University of Cape Town, and a man who also knew Lionel well, to give the first Lionel Opie lecture. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to start out by thanking Derek Yellen and At The Limits Scientific Committee for this tremendous honor of being able to give the inaugural Lionel Opie Lecture. As a global legend and icon, Lionel was an inspiration and an example to us as South Africans about what is possible and what is achievable with a commitment to academic excellence and scientific rigor. One of the things I remember most about Lionel was his insistence that before accepting any data, information, evidence, that it has to go independent, rigorous, critical analysis. Now, with that in mind, the title of my talk is HIV is a risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Is it time for Sub-Saharan Africa to change approach to CVD prevention in HIV? So what you have here is a map of the world showing the share of people with HIV who received antiretroviral therapy in 2017. And actually, it shows one of the great triumphs of healthcare in sub-Saharan Africa, where despite major resource limitations, over 70% of the 25 million people who live with HIV were on antiretroviral therapy, remembering that three years later, this number is even higher. Now, this is important, of course, because HIV has been transformed by antiretroviral therapy from a near-death sentence to a chronic disorder in which people can live healthy, dignified, and fulfilled lives. Now, as people with HIV live longer on their therapy, the proportion of death and disability that is non-AIDS-related has grown. What you see on the left is a pie chart showing the frequency of serious non-AIDS events for people on antiretroviral therapy 
who are virally suppressed over time. And what you see is that cancer and cardiovascular disease make up close to 70% of these events. Now, this type of data has led to growing concern amongst HIV clinicians in Sub-Saharan Africa, where questions are being raised about the public health sector's readiness to deal with what might be an emerging threat to the cardiovascular health on the continent, with calls for a pivot in the current approach to adopt a much more aggressive approach to cardiovascular disease prevention and management. Now, if we step back for a second and look at what is the evidence for HIV as a risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the bulk of it was summarized in the systematic review and meta-analysis published in circulation by Shah and colleagues, in which they showed that the crude rate for incident cardiovascular disease is 60 per 10,000 patient rate, which makes it the same as other high-risk groups such as diabetes, that the pooled risk ratio for cardiovascular disease is around two, that the disability-adjusted life years from HIV-associated cardiovascular disease was 1,800 per 100,000 persons. Now, I want to remind you that this is equivalent to other disorders like TB and stroke, stroke which are major killers and cause of disability in sub-Saharan Africa, and that the population attributable fraction for HIV-associated cardiovascular disease was between 15 and 24% in most of sub-Saharan Africa, where by comparison, it's less than 2% and less than 1% for much of the rest of the globe. Following the systematic review, the authors conclude our estimates have important policy implications for implementing appropriate cardiovascular disease risk gratification and treatment strategies across healthcare systems, especially where both HIV and cardiovascular disease are high. Now, some of the proposed new guidelines for this evaluation and management of cardiovascular risk in people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa were to assess all people for the presence of traditional cardiovascular risk factors, monitor bloods for lipid levels and evidence of dysglycemia at regular intervals, the use of scoring tools, uh, available scoring tools, and perhaps adding HIV as an independent risk factor, and having a very low threshold for the use of preventative statin therapy and or even a switch to more cardiometabolically friendly antiretroviral regimens. So whether the evidence is robust enough to change approach and practice is not clear. This is in the context of stretched healthcare infrastructure, competing health needs, competing social needs, and uncertainty about the benefit. Now, reproducible and verifiable population health data in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa is very sparse, and in order to derive burden, risk, and prevalence estimates, global health bodies have used sophisticated models. However, when, when these estimates have been compared to locally derived data, the accuracy has frequently been poor. If we go back to that meta-analysis and systematic review, it's important to note that only one of the studies was from Sub-Saharan Africa, and in the study, there were only 25 events, none of which were myocardial infarctions. And the rest of the data in the study is derived from these models from global disease uh, burden estimates. Now, where the prevalence and distribution of traditional risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease has been looked at, there's significant variation across the globe, and they're generally much lower across Sub-Saharan Africa. So these four maps show prevalence for smoking, dysglycemia and diabetes, dyslipidemia and elevated cholesterol, and smoking, and, what, and the age structure. And what you see is that for all of these, the risk in Sub-Saharan Africa is much lower. Now, where the correlation between actual burden of disease estimates with available data from prospective courts has been looked at, again, it's been very poor. A prime example of this is the Heart of Soweto study, which prospectively evaluated over 500 incident cardiac events in people living with HIV presenting to a large tertiary care center. And whereas the models would have predicted that over 20% of the events would be atherosclerotic disease-related, only 2.7% of the events were found to be so. Another issue is that whether the myocardial events and coronary disease-related events are related to predominantly atherosclerosis is not clear. Again, recent analysis of 30,000 patients uh, at a large network of integrated clinical systems in the United States suggests that over 50% of myocardial infarctions amongst people with HIV are actually type 2, 
i.e. related to supply demand and not type 1 related to plaque rupture and atherothrombosis. Again, with significance because of preventative and management implications. Another piece of evidence that challenges the idea that excess risk in patients with HIV is, cardiovascular, is atherosclerosis related is, is in prospective cohorts of people living with HIV, the standardized risk ratio for myocardial infarction and CVD related death is highest only in the first year after antiretroviral therapy is commenced. And it tapers fairly rapidly such that it returns to the general population risk within two years. And finally, if you look at ways of risk evaluation and try to look at how standardized available scores fare in these populations, then you find that there are significant challenges with all of them performing very poorly and either overestimating or underestimating significantly. The implication of all of this is that the excess risk of CVD events is related to delays in commencement of antiretroviral and advanced HIV and may not be related to accelerated atherosclerosis, and that early diagnosis and aggressive early treatment of HIV uh, may to mitigate against this excess risk is what is desired. So what is the way forward? What we need uh, in increased awareness of CVD in people living with HIV, better integration of NCD and HIV services to pick up those with cardiometabolic risk, promotion of healthy lifestyle with a focus on smoking, obesity, uh, healthy diet and exercise, while we await for more robust data and evidence. And in the meantime, the mainstay of cardiovascular disease, disease prevention may actually be earlier and better management of their HIV. Thank you for attention. Okay. Okay, stop, stop there, Mickey. Mapiko for a superb opening lecture to the for the Lionel Opie uh, uh, presentation. Um, we all will wait for questions to come in from the audience around the world. It takes a few minutes before they can be downloaded. But let me ask you uh, another question, um, and that is, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, what do most people die from? Is AIDS still huge or are vascular disease, coronary vas cardiovascular disease, still the number one? Can you? Can um, you hear me, Derek? Yes, let me just apologize to the audience. We've had a little technical hitch, and I've got Mapiko on iPhone talking through to us here, and that's been sent through to everybody uh, listening in. So, Mapiko, um, I've just explained why the sound is not perfect. Could you go ahead and see if you can answer the question? Yeah, if I heard it, I think you asked um, whether patients in sub-Saharan Africa are, uh, are still dying from non-AIDS or whether there's, there's been a switch as there has been in North America and Europe to non-AIDS related events. And the answer is basically that at present, whereas in North America and Europe, I think it's fair to say that antiretrovirals are adding between sort of 35 and 40 years from diagnosis. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's still much less, between 20 and 35 years, I would say. And um, this is about 70% of the mortality is still related to AIDS. And that it's really just a minority of events that's cardiovascular. Okay, let me ask you probably a very naive question as well here, but uh, from a pharmacologist's point of view, antiviral drugs, as, um, what other effects would they have generally? Would they have any direct cardiovascular effects, detrimental that is, in their own right? Yes, uh, Derek, I think it's a very important question. Um, so with regard to the cardiovascular system again, I think it's fair to say that uh, amongst the m multiple mechanisms that have been proposed for why there is this excess risk of cardiovascular disease and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in patients with HIV 
is indeed that uh, antiretroviral, uh, some of the mechanism is driven through antiretroviral therapy. And in particular, some of the older protease inhibitors were associated with dyslipid, with dysglycemia, dyslipidemia, and other metabolic derangements that were believed to possibly accelerate atherosclerosis and, and lead to these uh, atherosclerotic-related CVD events. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to have to stop it there, Bepico, because the sound is not perfect and um, the lecture was perfect. So let's leave it at that. And uh, let's all remember Lionel Opie very fondly. And thank you again uh, for your terrific presentation. Okay, I'm really uh, sorry about this. Uh, I've, yeah, anyway, thanks to the committee again for inviting me for this tremendous honor. Our, our right. pleasure. Thank you. Well, everyone, that concludes our cardiology, diabetes, and nephrology at the limits meeting. And we'd like to take this opportunity of really thanking all the speakers for their truly wonderful presentations, which have clearly enlightened us over the last two days. Our thanks must also go to all the chairpersons who have not only managed to navigate the complex logistics of a virtual meeting, but have also chaired each session so well. In addition, a grateful thanks to all the delegates who have joined us on the internet from over 40 countries worldwide. We thank you for attending this virtual meeting and for your questions which have enabled great discussion. We would also like to thank our conference organizing team who have helped coordinate this meeting from the very beginning when we decided to go virtual. And likewise, a big thank you to the technical team based at the Royal College of Physicians in London and led by David Jones, who have undertaken the complex logistics of this 